Hello everyone. Today we'll continue to talk about hypercapnia and we'll start talking about different etiologies that would result in hypercapnia. First of them is increased production. As we talked about in the previous lectures that this is one of the reason why the PaCO2 can increase. The other two being decreased ventilation and increased dead space ventilation. So before we begin, one of the terms that you have to know is something called respiratory quotient which is the ratio of CO2 produced by oxygen used. The respiratory quotient of carbohydrate is one because it releases six carbon dioxide molecules and uses six oxygen molecules to metabolize the glucose molecule completely. Any other carbohydrate has a similar respiratory quotient. Respiratory quotient of fats is much lower of the order of around 0.7 because you release less carbon dioxide and use more oxygen. You can figure out respiratory quotient of any molecule with the carbon, hydrogen and oxygen in the ratio of X, Y and Z using this formula. The CO2 is produced by the metabolism of glucose because that's where you get your energy from. The first step of glucose metabolism is glycolysis, which is an anaerobic process. The second part is the Krebs cycle or TCA cycle. And this is where your carbon dioxide is produced and the NADH that is produced during the Krebs cycle goes into oxidative phosphorylation and that's where the oxygen comes into play. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor. The different foods have different respiratory quotient because they enter the cycle in a different place. So for example, fats lipolysis results in production of acetyl-CoA. Various proteins or amino acids will enter some at level of pyruvate like alanine and cysteine and other amino acid will enter the Krebs cycle at a different point. High respiratory quotient is not good for CO2 retainer because you make more CO2 for the same amount of oxygen and as you can see the carbohydrates have respiratory quotient of 1 while fats have respiratory quotient of 0.7. So fats will produce less amount of carbon dioxide compared to carbohydrates. Overfeeding on other hand has respiratory quotient of 1.4. So try to avoid overfeeding your patient. Whenever you think about increased CO2 production, think about two conditions. Is the patient hypermetabolic or is he having increased muscular activity? Hypermetabolic state includes sepsis, fever, thyrotoxicosis, while muscular activity will increase in patients with agitation, seizures, increased work of breathing, patient with vent asynchrony, and a couple of rare syndromes. Fever results in thermogenic shivering and can require as high as six-fold increase in metabolic rate. And maintaining that temperature can increase your basal metabolic rate by 12% per one degree centigrade rise in core temperature. So one of the common mistakes that people do is try to cool these patients down using artificial means. However, this is not good for the patient because this will cause more shivering and it will increase agitation and increase CO2 production, thus worsening your hypercapnia even further. If you have to control fevers, give antipyretics. Let's talk a little bit about work of breathing. Work is force time distance and is measured in joules. So the work of breathing is the force that is generated by the respiratory muscles and the distance is the total distance moved by the diaphragm and the rib cage. This is a little difficult to visualize. However, if you multiply and divide this equation by area, you will get work as pressure times volume, where pressure is the driving pressure that is negative inspiratory pressure that is generated inside your pleura, multiplied by the tidal volume, that is the volume that you breathe in. One joule is required to move one liter of air through pressure gradient of 10 centimeter of water. In a normal person at rest, work of breathing is about 0.35 joules per liter of minute ventilation. Power is a rate of work, which is work by time. So it depends upon both on work of breathing and the respiratory rates. We'll discuss more about power when we talk about the mechanical ventilation. Let's understand work of breathing intuitively. You have alveolar pressure on the x-axis and the lung volume on the y-axis. And we'll look at the elasticity of chest wall depicted by this brown line 
and elasticity of lungs shown by blue line. When the elasticity of chest wall equals the elasticity of the lungs, that is the point of your functional residual capacity. If you apply a pressure to the lungs at FRC, you will generate a tidal volume and the area in the blue will be the elastic work required to inflate lungs and the area shown in red is the elastic work required to displace the chest wall. The work against airway resistance during inspiration is shown by the, the green area and this would depend upon the airway diameter and whether the flow is laminar or turbulent. Around 50% of the work of breathing is converted to heat and 50% is stored as a potential energy and this potential energy is used for expiration. As you start breathing deeper and faster, you increase your driving pressure and tidal volume, thereby increasing the total work of breathing. Under normal breathing, your lungs will use around 3 ml of oxygen every minute, which is less than 2% of the total basal metabolic rate. However, at higher workloads, as you start breathing faster, the additional oxygen that is being absorbed is used up by your respiratory muscles, thereby causing a plateau effect. Your respiratory muscles can sometimes require more than 30% of the total basal met metabolic rate. The efficiency of the respiratory muscles is not that great and is of the order of around 10%. So how do you figure out if there is increased work of breathing? Well, the best way is to just look at the, your patient and see if there are signs of tripoding, use of accessory muscles, flaring of nose, suprasternal knots or intercostal recessions, mouth breathing, patient would be restless and agitated, they'll be sweating, they'll have tachycardia and elevated BP. The simplest way to think about it is if you climb a flight of stairs, what kind of symptoms you will have and those symptoms will be present in these patients. It is important to figure out if there is an obstructive component to the work of breathing. The best way to figure it out is to examine your patient, look for wheezing and strider, look for prolonged expiration, pursing of lips and all the other signs that we talked before. You can also look at the waveforms on the BiPAP or the vent and you will see prolonged expiration. And if you look at the flow waveform for either BiPAP or the vent, there will be inability of these waveform to reach the baseline. So looking at this diagram, the first one is normal and you can see the flow waveform reaches zero while in the one shown as obstructive, the waveform does not reach zero when the next breath starts. This is sensitive of auto peeping or air trapping. You can also examine the capnogram to figure out an obstructive component. In the capnogram, the angle alpha slowly increases and the slope of the phase 3 slowly increases as well. And in the severe obstruction, the capnogram looks more like a shark fin. Some ventilators can give you a rough estimate of VCO2 and the way they calculate it is by calculating minute ventilation multiplied by the fraction of CO2 that is expired by the patient. To be more accurate, you can subtract the minute ventilation in the fraction of CO2 in inspired air and subtract that from the CO2 that is produced. Usually the second half of the equation is minimal, so you can possibly ignore that and your VCO2 should be equal to minute ventilation multiplied by the FeCO2. Using the VCO2, you can actually calculate the resting energy expenditure using modified Weir's formula. If there is a hypermetabolic state that you are encountering, try to treat the underlying etiology. Treat fevers with antipyretics, treat seizures. If you are looking at a ventilator asynchrony, you can change the vent modes and parameters. You can increase sedation and even sometimes you have to use paralytics. If patient is agitated, try to figure out what's causing the problem and you can use sedation and analgesia and sometimes paralytics to help you if the patient is severely hypercapnic or hypoxic because of this. In COPD patient, you can decrease the work of breathing by matching the auto-peep with peep. In a BiPAP, you can do a similar thing using 
CPAP. If there is an obstructive component present, try to treat it as well. You can use the bronchodilators and steroids, use regular suctioning and bron bronchoscopy to clear the secretions if indicated. You can use some mucolytics and mucokinetics if they are thick secretions. You should watch for biting or kinking of the tube. You should avoid overfeeding the hypercapnic patients. So in summary, think about increased metabolism or muscular activity when dealing with hypercapnia, especially on the ventilator. The same goes for hypoxemia as well. Treat underlying cause, treat your fevers and agitation, try to reduce work of breathing and reduce airway obstruction. If you've got VCO2 available on the ventilator, you can use it and trend it out to see if your therapies are working. Try to avoid overfeeding your patient. If you're persistently hypercapnic, you can try to reduce the respiratory quotient of the nutrition that you're giving your patient by decreasing the carbs and increasing the fats and proteins component in the tube feeds. Thank you.